I am Janie Bro, current treasurer of the Louisiana Master Naturalist. This is our first state meeting using Zoom, and we are pleased that about 75 members have signed up to be with us tonight. Our speaker this evening is our LMNA president, Dr. Robert Thomas. We all know him as Bob. Bob currently is professor of environmental communication and the director of the Center for Environmental Communication at Loyola. He received his doctorate in evolutionary biology from Texas A&M University and was a postdoc fellow in biochemistry at LSU Medical Center. He has held adjunct professorships at the University of New Orleans, Tulane University, and Louisiana State University. Bob was the founding director of the Louisiana Nature Center, as well as the past president of the Association of Nature Center Administrators, and has served on the Accreditation Commission of the American Association of Museums. But we are all here tonight to hear about Master Naturalist, and we are very pleased that Bob has been the instigator in getting our group started. And that is the focus of our meeting tonight. And I will turn it over to Bob, but I am inserting a post-editing note in that I neglected to turn on the record at the very beginning of Bob's talk. So this recording starts about two minutes into the meeting. Reflecting back, there were some things that happened, I think, that, uh, that really made me act differently. I mean, we were catching snakes all the time. And I, I, you, some of you have heard me tell the story that one night my dad, my dad was in the reserves, uh, Army Reserves then too. And uh, <clears throat> I was sitting there watching TV one night and he walked in from, uh, from reserve meeting and he said, Bob, there's a real herpetologist in my unit. So I sat there a few minutes, and then I followed him back to the bedroom. I said, what do you mean a real herpetologist? He said, he uses scientific names. And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah. And so I went straight in my bedroom, got out my brand new Conant Phil guide that had just been published, and uh, wrote down all the snakes that we were catching, wrote down all the scientific names, and carried that around until I memorized it. Not having had Greek or Latin, uh, we just pronounced them phonetically. And, but all of a sudden, all my buddies were using scientific names for snakes. Um, and, uh, and then I was asked to curate the snake collection at the little uh, Alexandria Zoo, which, which uh, gave me a lot of good experience, too. But um, so when I went out to college, I was, you know, pretty conversant. And, uh, and luckily, I got a job curating the herpetology collection, the reptile and amphibian research collection, and did that the whole time I was at USL then, uh, before I went to graduate school at A&M. But, um, but anyway, but that's sort of the, the, uh, the start that I had, and, it, and it, it was lucky because I had, like, why did I curate the snakes at the zoo? It's because my dad was real active in the First Methodist Church, one of his good friends there was the guy that had the biggest pest control company. He would get called to get snakes out of houses. He preserved them so he could put them in jars so he could show them to people when he talked about the different kinds of snakes. He sponsored the thing at the zoo and he knew what I knew and, and we talked all the time. So he gave me that opportunity. So, you know, usually it's being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people not something you plan, you just kind of fall into it. But then, uh, then I taught high school for, th for three years in Arneville and loved it. At never thought I would teach high school, but I adored it. But I always knew I was going to graduate school. So when I went to graduate school, I was uh, off to get a, a PhD in herpetology, no doubt about that. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, and also tropical biology, because I was very interested in the New World tropics. And so that's where I sort of focused, as you'll see the snakes that, few snakes that I'm going to show you here uh, are, are from South America. 
that's where I do most of my research work, where most of my publications have come out of South America, with some out of Central America and that sort of thing, uh, and other places. But, uh, but anyway, um, uh, it's kind of funny when you sit, and I'm old enough now that I reflect a lot on these things about how did this happen and how did I get here, and, um, uh, and it's always something somebody said to you. Think about that. If you haven't thought about that lately, um, think about it because somebody can just make a statement like there's a real herpetologist in my unit and it can change the direction of your life and the focus of your life. And I have a whole list of things like that, that, uh, that have happened to me from other people. Uh, and, and unfortunately some of those people are gone and I really, really regret that I hadn't thought about some of those statements that my dad made. Um, so I could say, did, did you mean to say that? Did, did you say that to me on purpose? Or was it just something you said and you totally forgot about? And it had incredible impact on me. So, um, and I actually wrote an article about, entitled, Did He Mean to Say That? About some things that my dad said that, that have always stuck with me and really changed my, my direction. Um, but, and I, but I had a very tolerant mother. I mean, because I was keeping snakes all through high school. And I remember the, the one time, and this is really weird. I cannot believe this. I, I had a six-foot rattlesnake in my bedroom in a cage. I can believe that. I can't believe my mother and dad allowed me to have that. But they trusted me, I guess. But I know they worried all the time. And um, we had a, I had a baby sister in the house. It was 17 years younger than me. And when she, when she came home, uh, my dad told me, he says, look, he says, you can keep your rattlesnake, but every time you leave this house, it's got to leave with you. I don't want it here when the baby's here. And um, so I built a traveling cage. <laughs> and every time I left the house, dutifully, it was put in the cage, put in the trunk of my car. Everybody knew about it. I would have students from high school would see me coming down the road and they would wave me down and I knew what was going on. They were with somebody I didn't know and they had just wagered, I bet you five dollars that car coming right there has a big rattlesnake in the trunk <laughs> and uh, when we get together for our reunions they all bring that stuff up and talk about it. But, um, but anyway, but that was sort of uh, uh, my life growing up to, to go off to college and um, and I've sort of been head over heels into nature ever since and stayed right on that path. Now, graduate school, typical. I even taught courses in nature centers for learning at A&M and museum science. And uh, so I'm on the path and I'm studying snakes. And then when we got out of there, uh, we came to New Orleans and I got this postdoc at LSU Medical Center. That's where Joel and I met. And... Uh, uh, I am not a biochemist by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it was like a duck out of water. But while I was there, they, they made me teach nursing biochemistry and organic chemistry, which was fun. <laughs> One of the great things in my life. But it gave me a tremendous appreciation for the value of biochemistry and, and, uh, and organic chemistry. So... Um, but again, I was still on the same path. I was there to, to learn how to use biochemical techniques to study snakes. And one day my, my advisor came in and handed me a stack of paper. And he says, you might be interested in this. This sounds like you. And it was a, a, a letter that had been sent all over the city saying they were recruiting somebody to be the, the director of the Louisiana Nature Center that was not built yet. And, um, and it really did interest me. It's what I always wanted to do. And uh, never didn't think it would happen in New Orleans. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that he was probably trying to get rid of me because I wasn't a good biochemist. <laughs> but he and I were dear friends, and I think he was just looking out for me. But, uh, but anyway, I got lucky and got that job. And so that uh, people are always asking me, why, why are you a professor of mass communication at Loyola w with your training in evolutionary biology? And the answer to that is that I backed in to communication by being the director of a nature center where I was doing radio shows, 
even doing commercials for my nature center, um, uh, doing TV appearances, being interviewed. Every time something weird went on in Louisiana, even the national people came down and they, they wanted to talk to a scientist. None of the other scientists would talk to them. So by default, they got me. And uh, so I got real used to it, and I, and I enjoyed it. So when I, when I applied for the job at Loyola, I didn't think I had a chance to get it, but I did. And it was one of the great things that happened to me in life. Um, because now I'm teaching biology. I'm teaching in the environment program. I'm doing herp, herp research. Uh, and I'm doing uh, documentaries and all sorts of communication type stuff. So that's what I told you at the beginning. I followed a circuitous route, but stayed on the same path. Uh, and everything is interconnected. I'm just doing it at a different level. So, uh, so that's the way a lot of y'all know me from different parts of that life. And um, uh, I mean, I, I still have people that are surprised that I study snakes because they know me through communications or something like that and vice versa. So, um, so that's kind of how I got to where I am. Now, talk about the master naturalist. Uh, I found out about Master Naturalist programs back in the 80s, I guess it was. I'd heard about them. And I thought, well, this is a perfect thing for the Nature Center. I mean, we need to have a better adult education program. And this gives it organization. And it uh, gives it sort of a club atmosphere for people to join. So I called uh, the uh, LSU Ag Center and asked them if they would want to sponsor that because that's what it was done in almost all states. Almost all the states today uh, have a state affiliation and actually staff members that are paid for by the state to sort of coordinate all the chapters. So they're really kind of public state organizations. So um, when I did that, there was no interest. They said, no, we just, no, it's not something we do. I, I don't even... I don't think the uh, Master Gardeners was going in the 80s, was it? I'm sure we got some Master Gardeners in the, the crowd here. Uh, so we really didn't have anything like that in Louisiana. And um, so I just dropped it. And uh, I'm surprised I didn't just start, start a chapter at our nature center, but I didn't. And uh, so back about uh, 2011, I guess, uh, I got a call from the, at that time, uh, associate director of the uh, Ag Center. And he said, are you still interested in that? And I said, sure, I really am. And he said, okay, we're having a meeting down at the Sheridan. Would you come down here for coffee at three o'clock? And so I went down there and he and Rusty Godet, who many of you know, Rusty's uh, advisory on our, on our uh, state board and he's on our board at GNO. And I knew we were in college together at USL, so I've known him forever. Uh, was there and uh, and we talked through it and so then we called him uh, I said let's have a meeting and so they Rusty said well I, I know people all over the state I'll I'll invite people that I think might be interested so we had a meeting and it was very enthusiastic everybody was very enthusiastic and uh, we talked a lot about what we needed to do to make it work and uh, then we left and months and months and months passed and nothing happened. And then about a year later, we said, okay, let, let's have another meeting. We, we need to do this. This is good for the state. And so we held another meeting, invited all the same people. Most of them came. And we talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. And then we left. And while I was driving home, I thought, you know, all right, somebody's just got to dive in. Because it, it, that's, the, that's the, the group process when you're spread all over the state. And so when I got home, I sort of did a mini meeting <laughs> in New Orleans, and I called in about 20 people that I knew were avid naturalists in different fields. And I said, will you come to a meeting to talk about a farming a chapter of that? And uh, just about everybody came. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, from that moment on, we, our chapter uh, was up and going, uh, in, you know, full-blown uh, by uh, 2012 uh, had taken about six months to kind of put everything together and get some money together and get people together and how are we going to advertise it starting from scratch and um, um, 
and uh, and we really had really really good people. And a few people dropped out because they they just they you know we were too busy. We were meeting weekly back then, <laughs> so I kept kept saying it isn't going to always be this way. Hang with us. But uh, but eventually we got down to our uh, uh, you know having fewer meetings. But um, but it's worked out well, and we did it from scratch. We did talk to people in Texas, and we talked to some other uh, state chapters to see uh, in other states how they did things, how they set it up, and we basically patterned ourselves after Texas. The big difference is that Texas Master Naturalist has 50-some-odd chapters, and they, uh, they're all over that huge state, and they've got two full-time employees who co coordinate activities. And they've got incredible number of members. Uh, and they're so specialized now that they're, some of their chapters are not just master naturalist chapters. They focus on one aspect of it entirely. Like there's a chapter at the Armand Bayou Nature Center. Uh, that's in Clear Lake City where the NASA facility is. And almost all the the central members, I mean, it has nothing to do with being a member, but most of the active members are retired from NASA, NASA retirees, engineers. And so they do all sorts of technology type things related to nature with uh, using tracking devices and uh, uh, all, you know, all just, it's amazing when you go there to talk to them about the things that they do. Uh, but then there are some chapters like we have that are just general chapters, which to me is preferable. So, uh, so anyway, so then we, uh, we started talking it up, talking to friends in other cities. And, uh, uh, and within that, I guess the first year, uh, uh, Baton Rouge came on as a chapter. And uh, is that right, Art? Did y'all come on at, uh, well, you're, you're muted, but... Um, I think y'all came on in 13, maybe somewhere around that time. But, uh, but anyway, the, uh, uh, and, and then we were talking to Acadiana, uh, and then we started talking to Larry Raymond and, and those guys uh, up in Shreveport. They came on real quickly. Uh, and then, so and then we went around the state. We looked at, we targeted the larger cities. So Lake Charles came on, uh, uh, Betty and her crew came on up in Monroe. Uh, and then the last chapter to be added is Senla in Alexandria, where the Trammels are in there. And that was an interesting conversation because Sonny and Betsy had just retired. They're from Alexandria. And uh, uh, they had retired from a job in West Virginia. And they were members of the Master Naturalist of West Virginia. And as soon as I found that out, I was like, I pounced on them. And I said, you know, y'all really need a chapter up here. You just got to do a chapter. You just got this is natural for you. And they said, we loved it, but we're retired now. <laughs> and, uh, but I stayed on them, and then one day my phone rang, and they said, okay, we decided to do it. And, uh, and so they're having a lot of fun up there. But, uh, and, I, you know, we're always open to other chapters and different types of chapters that maybe do fewer things with fewer people and fewer resources, but still are doing the same things that all the rest of us are doing. And... Um, um, and we, we thought for a while there uh, that we were going to be affiliated with the Ag Center again. And they actually had budgeted money, and then the governor cut them to the quick, and they lost all their budget. So they called me one day and said, we, I'm sorry, we just can't do this as much as we want to. Uh, then we, we did get a uh, – we have an MOU with uh, Wildlife and Fisheries. It doesn't have any money attached to it or – or staff or anything, but boy, they've been wonderful for all of our chapters. I'm, I think all the chapters have been taking advantage of wildlife and fisheries personnel. And um, uh, so now, so then, then we, uh, we, we got a bunch of us from the chapters got together and decided how to put a state organization together with each chapter uh, giving three names, uh, people from their chapter that would represent them. And, uh, and the chapters completely control who serves on that board. Uh, board, we, we, for a while there, and I don't know that we're going to continue to do that, we were ratifying what the boards did. But the reality is that it's really up to the chapters. 
And if somebody doesn't perform, they have to remove them. If they, if they, uh, they want to remove, then they have to replace them and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, we had to go through the whole process of bylaws. Now we're working on the uh, procedures and policy handbook. Um, but then finally, after talking about it for a couple of years, we said, hey, we've got to have a state meeting. And so that's where the rendezvous was, was born. Um, and uh, we like the word because that's what we do. We go in the woods and we rendezvous. And uh, uh, that has been fabulous. I, I, I hope all of you have had a chance to come to a rendezvous. Unfortunately, we had to cancel this year. But uh, we'll be back in Pollock, Louisiana uh, next April for our next rendezvous. And then after that, after that, that's the last one that the LMNA, the Louisiana Master Naturalist Association, puts on. And from that time on, it's going to rotate from chapter to chapter to chapter to chapter. And that does two things. Number one, the chapters take responsibility for doing most of the work, although we'll still the rest of us are going to pitch in to help logistically. Uh, but it also gives us a chance to move around the state and have our meetings in different places in the state uh, because that's always been one of our dreams as well. Every chapter is a little bit different because of where we're sitting. And uh, we thought it would be wonderful uh, to be able to, uh, to, to go to, to Shreveport and learn about the, uh, the uh, flora and fauna in that area. And um, uh, as a matter of fact, we, um, uh, we do have a number of members that are in more than one chapter, that belong to more than one chapter. They, they're all active in one chapter. But we've had a couple of people who were trained in our chapter, but they either worked or they lived near Baton Rouge. And uh, they transferred to Baton Rouge, but maintained their, their affiliation with our chapter. Um, and then we've, uh, same thing between Alexandria and, uh, uh, Acadiana and, uh, and I'm sure others of you have people who belong to more than one chapter. And what I was telling somebody the other day, we had a, we had a board meeting and I said, I'm waiting for that, that, uh, CDO person. Remember what, what, what CDO stands for? Mm -mm. No. That's, uh, oh, well, all of a sudden I just went blank on what, what's the obsessive term? OCD. You mean OCD. Well, yes, I yes. But a CDO person is so OCD that they alphabetize the letters. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so we're waiting, we're waiting for that person who says, I'm going to get certified in every chapter in this state. And you know it's going to happen. Just can't wait to watch it happen. So anyway, so that's where we are today, and uh, uh, our dreams are to be a better uh, organization. We're trying to figure out ways that uh, the state organization can service the chapters, because right now, right now, those of you that are not aware of the administration of the chapter, we're all 501c3 not-for-profit cha uh, chapters, so we stand alone, but we share with one another our bylaws and procedures and techniques and everything. There are just a handful of things that we all do. Like we all do educational workshops. We all, when people finish, do volunteer uh, in our stuff in our area. We have to do continuing education. We have to pay some small dues just to give the chapters a little bit of working cash. Uh, none of us have staff. Nobody gets paid in the organization. Uh, the only people that get paid are people outside of our organization who come in and give talks and stuff. We, if we can, we give honoraria. And um, uh, so uh, that's sort of where we are today. And, but we did start the rendezvous. We are looking at insurance so, so that we can all share insurance in one focus place. We have not been successful yet, but that doesn't mean that we're not looking. It does not mean that we're not going to be successful. Um, and um, uh, and, and we're, uh, we, oh, by the way, we do have a, a statewide uh, Outstanding Naturalist Award that's named after Caroline Dorman. And we just gave that to, to uh, uh, awarded that to Kelby Uchley a couple of weeks ago via, via Zoom. And uh, Betty had, uh, Betty's chapter had nominated him, so she kind of hosted the, uh, 
presentation over Zoom. He's going to be at the next rendezvous where he'll give a keynote address, as well as the 2021 Dorman winner will be there to give a keynote. So we'll get to see him. And, um, uh, and we're just always looking for things that, that we can do uh, from a centralized area without making it too rough on the non-paid board members <laughs> who aren't getting any remuneration for their time. But um, it has been a thrill uh, to get to know all the people statewide that, that uh, we've all gotten to know. And it's been a thrill to, uh, to justify spending more time in nature. I was to the point where I was staying inside too much and doing too much administration and um, writing grants and doing projects and things like that. And now I'm outside a lot and it feels good. And, uh, and I, I, I hear that from a lot, of, a lot of master naturalists. So now we're starting to push the envelope for where do we go from here? I know, uh, uh, is it Acadiana that has the, uh, an advanced certification? Or who, who is, that? is that? Is that Baton Rouge? Yeah, Somebody just I told us about it. If somebody knows and can answer, unmute yourself and answer and then... Oh, it was, you know. um, I had referenced Florida. Yeah, but I think it's happening in one of our chapters. Oh, I don't know. Where, but, um, I had referenced yeah. Florida at our last board meeting. Yeah, I, th I, th I think, and, and this is not... I thought y'all were doing it. Uh, well, we're, we're starting something that we call in a graduated certification, but we don't have anybody in it yet because we just haven't kicked it off. But where you can actually get three different levels above by doing a whole bunch of different things uh, to earn that. And, uh, and I know it's going to catch on with some people. I mean, you know, we're very cautious to tell people, you don't have to do this. We value the, certif the certified master naturalist. That's what we value. But for those of you who want to go further, and that other, the other chapter that was doing that, I think they, they have like four or five workshops that if you do them, you become, you get that little like an advanced. Bob. Uh, that make? was that was me that was telling you about it. This is Catherine. Oh, hey, Catherine. I was, I was telling you about it. For Florida, there's four special topics you do, and you become an advanced master naturalist mm. when you get done with that. So that's okay. I, I was the one who was telling you about it because I just went through two because it was 100% online for the first time. Good, good. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I thought you were telling me you were already doing it. Yeah, you yeah. know. Well, it's a great idea. And what we're doing this summer, we're, we're doing Wednesday night workshops on Zoom. And um, so we've already, we're going to talk at our next executive and board meetings uh, next month uh, about doing something like that and just saying, look, if you, if you do these things extra and beyond the hours that we require for advanced, then they go toward being an advanced certified naturalist. And a lot of people are very interested in that because it's pretty quick, kind of down and dirty, and you learn stuff and it's fun. Uh, whereas the graduated thing is a little bit more in depth. But I think that the advanced thing will suck people into the graduated. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know, no pressure. So, uh, can, let's, let's put my, my pictures up. I, somebody had called in and asked if I would just spend a couple of minutes talking about the snake work that I do. So I put about seven, seven slides together. Okay, Bob, um, I can, you can screen share, but. Um, yeah, I just lost it when I did that. I had a glitch on my computer gang. But before you, before you go to the snakes, um, there was a couple other questions that people had put in. Okay, well, hang on. Let me, let me get back on here. Talk on it. Okay. I've got three screens here in front of me and one of them went dead five minutes before the program's, uh, <laughs> Four seven, and um, I can put up your snakes. Do you want your snakes now? Yeah, go ahead and do that. I can't see anything yet. Okay. But well, while, but I'm I'm getting, okay while I'm getting the snakes up, one other question that's question kind of, you kind of alluded to is um, you said you were able to spend a lot more time outside. Um, what has been your favorite local nature escape during your COVID um, stay at home? Um, my backyard. How's that? <laughs> I mean, that, that's the actual answer because I'm here so much and I never am here this much. And, I, and so my birds are very happy. They're eating like crazy. 
they're getting a lot of variety and um and i'm really enjoying that so that's sort of a weird place to say is your favorite nature place right now but but i'm a big fan of all the marshes around here and um uh, i've just been very careful about staying closer to home because of the unknowns but uh but that's gonna hopefully that's gonna end soon and we're gonna be able to get out more into nature Okay, I think everybody, does everybody see Bob snakes? We can see them, yes. Okay. Bob snakes? <laughs> okay, Bob, yeah. you're going to have to uh, just holler at me when you want me to. Yeah, well, go to the next one. Uh, I just wanted to show you, you know, remember I work in South America, and uh, uh, the, the, the main target, the one I did my PhD on, and I'm still working on publications on that, is uh, uh, this genus Philodryas, which, which means loves trees. Uh, so, uh, you can bet a lot of them are, are arboreal, but all of them are not. And that's what the distribution of the genus is, even on the west side of the Andes and, uh, and then all over the Amazon down into Argentina. And they're basically like racers here. I mean, if, if you saw them, if you saw a preserved specimen, you would think it was just a, a local racer. They are rear fang snakes. Some of them are, are kind of toxic, but, uh, but there's a lot of, I think there are about 18 species. So next slide. You're going to think they're all green because a handful of these are green. But uh, they th this is a new species that uh, I should have described uh, 20 years ago. But I've got a paper sitting here that hopefully I can get this thing out before somebody beats me to it. It's not like it's an unknown new species. But uh, uh, it's from Bolivia. And... Um, uh, really nice snake. I mean, these things are lizard eaters. They will eat other snakes. They will eat small mammals. Next slide. This is another green one, but look how different it is. Look at the tip of that snout. Uh, it's got sort of a fleshy protuberance on the end. These are very arboreal, and they come in brown and green, just right out of the same egg, egg clutch, some, green, some brown, some green. Uh, uh, and uh, again, they don't really have common names that you would recognize. Seems like everybody who uses a common name makes up a new one, uh, but it's Philodryas baroni. Beautiful snakes get six feet long. I remember when I got my first ones in Argentina, this was in an, at an older time when you could, nobody was checking you at, at, at the airport. And I remember getting on an airplane to fly from Buenos Aires to, uh, uh, to Miami. And I had a bag with three of these things, each one of them over six feet long uh, in a cloth bag. And I just put it up with the luggage and off we went. <laughs> Nobody looked. Nobody said anything. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. Next slide. This is a splendid looking beast that lives out in the Mato Grosso, which is a big grassland area of uh, Bolivia and uh, 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 Brazil, especially into Paraguay. Matagrosensis, Philodryas matagrosensis, is a beautiful snake. Next slide. It's a, it's a racer, basically. And back to green. Uh, this is Philodryas ulfersi. There are three different forms of this animal, and they're all green, but some of them have black on the head, some of them have tan tops to the heads, and some of them are just completely green. And um, this one's a pretty, a pretty hot one. I mean, if they bite you, uh, some people have pretty, pretty tough reactions to it. Next slide. Joel, that's the one I caught in the Pantanal. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then this is another green one. This is, this is an arboreal snake. They live up in the canopy. They very rarely come to the ground. And uh, they remind me very much of a, of a rat snake because they have angulate ventral scales, which allows them to crawl directly straight up a uh, tree trunk. Uh, uh, but these have, have caused some problems with their venom as well. And they're irascible snakes. They're not nice at all. Next slide. And see, some of them come in brown, so I thought I wanted to at least show you one brown one. There are several species that are brown. And this one is not very arboreal, but it will go up in bushes like our racers do. And uh, it, it occurs in, uh, all the way down into the Pantanal, but all the way up to... Uh, the Tocantins, which is uh, up in the northeast of Brazil. Nice looking snake, though, really pretty. Next slide. 
And then this is one of the weird ones. We've, we've added a couple of species into the genus that look, look at the shape of it. Look how long and skinny and it's sitting there holding its tongue out and still to collect uh, particles from the air, trying to figure out what's going on. But look how pointy the head is. It looks like a vine snake, but it's actually a philodryas. And um, uh, there are uh, three species now that we've added to the genus that uh, used to be in a different genus. They used to be in the same thing as, as uh, vine snakes. Really cool snakes, pretty common in Ecuador. Find them all the time when we're out at night. Uh, moving around in the trees. Next slide. The other group I work on is the genus Thamnodynastes, and uh, some of the species I can tell, I can hold them in my hand and tell you what species they are. A lot of them you can't because they're, they're, they defy identification until you count scales and look at other features, do head, head measurements and that sort of thing, but they all kind of look alike. Look at that one, look at the next one, even though it's orange. Go to the next one. It's another Thamnodynastes species. And uh, this is one that uh, I've described a, a bunch of new species in and still have some more to go. But um, uh, interesting snakes, but frustrating because they're just hard, 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 hard to tell apart. And, uh, but there's a lot of good herpetologists in South America. When I, when I was in graduate school, there were two or three herpetologists in the entire continent. Now there's lots, and they're very good at what they do. So a lot of these things are going to be described very soon. So then, of course, the last one, and I, I hate to even say this because it's like I'm bragging, but this is uh, Pseudalsophus thomasi from the Galapagos. And some of you know that, that it was described a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, uh, this is from Santiago and Ratitaba uh, and Bartholomew is where they occur. And I've, I've actually ha held them in my hand when I'm down there, not knowing it was a new species. But um, there are a number of species of snakes in the Galapagos. And uh, the, the funny thing was, and it was actually, this is what was said in the, in the advocate. They, they picked it up and wrote about it. And they said, three new species have been described in the, in the Galapagos. One named after Charles Darwin. One named after the Greek god of fire. And one <laughs> named after Bob Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and the person who summed it up best was one of my grandchildren who said, somebody said, did you know that they named a snake after Pops? And he said, you mean there's a snake named Bob? <laughs> so I call that Bob. Anyway, pretty snake though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that's sort of the high, the best thing that can happen to a, bi a snake biologist or any kind of taxonomic biologist is having something named after you, because you know it could have been a bacterium or a nematode or something like that. It's a Galapagos snake. So anyway, those are the animals I work on, and um, it's a lot of fun. Now, hey, it's part time. Obviously, I'm a professor. I do all these things at the university. I ran a nature center for many years that was everything that being a director is. And uh, so these things just sat in a folder for years and years and years. And now I'm back to uh, working on them. I've published two papers since, uh, since we left school in, in March uh, on these animals. So, um, so maybe I can go downhill and put away a lot of junk in my den. So that's my life. <laughs> now, many of you know my daughter, M.A., and she's a spider biologist and, so, and also uh, focuses on the tropics. And so um, uh, she and I have one of the great things about this is that she and I travel a lot in the tropics to really weird places. And since she's a spider person, she's got to go out at night as well. So we tromp the jungles at night looking for snakes and spiders and anything else that moves. So any questions? Any questions on chat? Uh, let's see, there was um, one question that uh, relates to snakes that you kind of alluded to, but you didn't uh, directly uh, address. Mm -hmm. Can you share a scary snake, snake story, uh, something that, um, of course, you deal with venomous snakes a lot. None of them might be scary to you, but... Um, um, something that, um, you know, well, you know, I might not be, be fooling with this. Yeah. Well, I think all of us worry about venomous snakes. And, uh, you know, 
being a tropical biologist, um, uh, my early years, my first couple of decades in the tropics, uh, I won't say I was terrified, but I was always very nervous moving through the, the bush because uh, of the fear of the lance and some of these really, really dangerous snakes. And a friend of mine out in, in Arizona, uh, a doctor who works on snakes, uh, a medical doctor, uh, was curious about that because here he had been going down there a lot and he didn't know anybody who had been bitten by one. But he knew the stories of people who had really bad bites. Some of them died and some of them had to lose a, a limb because of uh, uh, compartmentalization and that sort of thing. But um, he did a study and he did a pretty thorough study where he was looking and he was interviewing biologists, botanists, mammalogists, ornithologists, herpetologists who were working in Central America, especially from from like Guatemala down to Costa Rica. And uh, he found that there was one, and those people who were out knocking around at all hours, he found that there was one venomous snake bite in that crowd for every 50,000 hours in the field. That's amazing. That's, that's nothing. That's rare. And uh, that changed my attitude about everything. But still, when I'm in Trinidad and we've got the world's largest pit viper there, the Bushmaster, that I have never found, and I'm always pursuing them, always looking for them, they're not uncommon at the Azorite Nature Center. Um, you have to be a little nervous because a, these things can get 12 feet long and their fangs are over two inches long. And they have a venom that's one of only two species of snakes in the world who the older they get, the more toxic their venom drop for drop becomes. So it's got everything to be the worst thing on earth. Um, but we started the Nature Center in 1967 in Trinidad. We've had hundreds of thousands of visitors. We've had one venomous snake bite and it was a bushmaster bit a lady from denmark uh when she was out jogging and ran by it and startled it and uh so that's the kind of, that's the way but i was going to tell you the, the scariest story i ever had was when i was in college i was down in florida and i was looking for rattlesnakes and you know these eastern diamondbacks get big and i was alone away from the crowd and i saw a little area where it kind of went down and there were a bunch of palmettos growing in there. And I said, well, that looks like a good place for a rattlesnake. And as I walked down into that little slumped area, there was a log sitting there. So I walked over with my rake. I was going to turn the log over. I put my rake on the log and got ready to pull it. And all of a sudden, the back of my brain said, Bob, there is a rattlesnake coiled up at your feet. And I looked down and there was a five-foot rattlesnake coiled up against that log. My feet were probably about six inches from it, and I was getting ready to pull that log on top of it. That would have not been good. <laughs> and I think about that now. Every time I turn a log, I look real closely. But that was probably the closest I ever came to getting bitten. Okay. Oh, and, and I, oh I, Betty, you I, want mommy, to I do want to talk about diversity. About Somebody had asked that. Go ahead. You have some things in the chat. You want me to go through what's in the chat? Sure. Can I talk about diversity okay. for a moment? Because somebody yes, please. had, had uh, contacted us about that. Uh, uh, somebody had asked me to make some comments because this organization we belong to um, uh, has recently sent out some, uh, uh, some uh, threads on how to increase your diversity or what they're doing is what it is, not how to. It's what they're doing. And so if there's anybody out there who's really serious about this, please send me an email and I will forward those links to you uh, so you can read them. But basically, we have in our, in our bylaws, uh, we have a uh, non-discriminatory uh, statement, you know, that we are open to everybody. We encourage uh, diverse members. Uh, we uh, uh, search for diversity and membership, and we're very serious about it. And um, 
Uh, are we really successful at it? Not so, not as much as we, as we thought we would be. But we've had quite a few uh, uh, people from other uh, racial groups uh, become certified master naturalists. But in our chapter, uh, most of them have uh, gotten a better job somewhere else and moved. You know, it was nothing about not being welcomed or I mean, we're really looking all the time. And uh, so I think on the one hand, that's all you can do. But on the other hand, in today's world, you got to be proactive and because, because we want that diversity. And uh, so we've got a committee now that I hope is going to be much more successful than, uh, than what we've done before uh, to do recruitment. I mean, we've, we've done tabling at uh, Xavier University as an example. We have certified master naturalists from Xavier, uh, uh, one white, one black, and, uh, but they're teaching there. And uh, so we haven't turned anybody up through that venue yet, but we will. We will. And, um, uh, and I think that that's very, very important. So if anybody's interested in it, please let me send you these, uh, these documents that we just got and uh, tell me what you do. Tell me when you have successes. That ought to be something we share at the board level all the time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, first question in the chat is, um, should Louisiana consider a core course for master naturalists, allowing regional courses, but a core course that everybody, a core curriculum that everybody shares? Well, all I can give is a personal opinion on that, because you've brought it up before. And uh, uh, basically, uh, we're open to that, knowing full well that because we're regional, we have to kind of focus on what's going on in our area. But I bet you, if we sat down at a table with one representative from each, each chapter, we'd find out that we do have a core. And I think it would be, if we do, it would be a good thing to recognize that and call them core courses. I mean, at Loyola, we have the Loyola core that every kid on campus takes. And then they go out and take their majors and minors and, that sort, and electives and things like that. And I think it's really, really a good thing. So... I'd certainly support it. Uh, what happened to the Louisiana Nature Center? Uh, right now it's closed because of the COVID issue, but it got, uh, it got a bad hit during Katrina. And then um, uh, and, and at that time, now, we merged with Audubon Institute in 1994. And I, I didn't mention that a while ago, but I spent two years as a, a vice president and had an office of environmental affairs at uh, uh, at Audubon. Uh, I left that to go to, to Loyola, and then they didn't replace me in that position. But um, the, uh, they were doing quite well, but, but you know, nature centers don't make a lot of money, and that's an organization that's got a huge budget. And so it, it just, you know, they were always wondering, how do we make more money with the nature center? And I said, you don't. Nature centers, no, I've been to hundreds of them in the United States, and they're all built to educate the local public and keep the prices down so everybody can afford it and giving away a lot of free admission to people that can't afford it. That's what nature centers do. And um, so, uh, so after the storm, a decision was made not to do anything, and they left the buildings open, and they just rotted for a number of years. And then um, FEMA got involved and said, you remember that money we gave y'all for the nature center? Well, you're either going to build a new nature center or you're going to give that money back. And it was a bunch of million dollars. And so they rebuilt a really nice structure out there, rebuilt the trails. Um, and um, it's really pretty. And it's really nice to go out there and walk the trails and that sort of thing. Uh, but right now it's closed and they've, they've uh, let all their naturalists go, uh, hoping that at some point when the zoo gets rolling again, which they're about to do, and the aquarium and the insectarium, that they'll be able to, uh, to open it again. You can't walk the trails while it's closed? No. It's, well, you can. <laughs> but there, are, there, there, is a, there, there is a groundskeeper and a... And a uh, security guy out there. They'll probably run you off 
but uh, but try it if you're there sometime because they, they might allow you to walk. Where is it? It's in uh, Joe Brown Park, the back half of Joe Brown Park, and uh, off of Reed Boulevard. Or actually, the gate now is off of Lake Forest Boulevard, where you turn directly into the Nature Center, but that'll be locked right now. And um, uh, uh, and it's but it's right off. Of, you know where Reed Boulevard is? It's where the big shopping center used to be. Yeah. Yeah. We, we used to do one of our workshops there, and, and it was wonderful. There were a lot of great things to talk about out there, but then we had to kind of move away from it while they were under construction, and we haven't gone back yet, but we will at some point. Uh, there's another question, but I'm going to skip over it for a moment to go because this one has to do with the diversity again, uh, and it's could we specifically reach out to first-line schools and offer educational programs to encourage diversity and inclusion? Yeah, you mean actually go do programs for them? Great idea. Yeah. That's and I, we do have a lot of our, our uh, certified master naturalists who do things at schools and for groups from schools and or, or maybe they're leading something at a, another facility in City Park or something like that for the schools to come out. Uh, so I think that's great. But we also, and, and that's also a fertile place to try to recruit teachers to become master naturalists. I'm going to piggyback a question on there that, that because we're at a point that reminds me of it. One of my dreams is junior master naturalists. We have yes, one sir. member here in the Northeast who has a young son, and he's too young. We don't yes, allow sir. anybody under 18 at our workshops, but right. he is so interested Mm -hmm. And so I just, I feel like we should, if we had something for the kids, have you had, do you know of any chapters, that, any place that does that? I want people to pipe in if they're doing it, put it on the chat thing and we'll call on you. Put it on the chat but, and I'll call yeah. on you. But um, uh, yeah, we're, we're past eight o'clock. I don't want people to get too bored here. But, uh, but the thing is that um, uh, a group of our certified master naturalists, sort of formed a committee on their own and told the board that they were doing that. And they put together a plan to do a junior master naturalist program. And, uh, and we told them, we said, you know, we're not ready for that. We, we, in terms of it being part of us and going under 18. And they said, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, we're going to run it. And it's not going to be affiliated with the chapter, but it's going to be because of the chapter that it's here. So we, we can take credit for it. And, uh, and then, uh, then some of them moved, you know, or moved, changed jobs. And, uh, but I know it's going to come back because and, and we're who, asked that, we're asked that question all the time, Betty. Okay. Who was it that said that, to, who approached you about that? Uh, some of our, our recently certified master naturalists. Oh, okay. Okay. All of them yeah. were, all of them were in their late twenties mm -hmm. you know, and they just really, they did a good job putting it together. It's just that it did not happen for a variety of those human reasons. Uh, somebody's asked, doesn't B-T-N-E-P -N -E offer a junior master naturalist program? I don't, B-T-N-E-P. Oh, that's be Barataria Terrebonne National oh, Historic okay. Program. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if they do or not. That's a good question. I ought to know that. But I haven't ever heard about it, but that doesn't mean they're not doing it. Because that, listen, if any of you don't know about Baratari National Estuary Program, you need to know about them. They are superb. I mean, they have good naturalists. We've had many good teachers from there that are and who are on our board and and uh, uh, the backbone of our chapter. So, okay. But, you know, the Audubon Zoo does too, but it's just different. I mean, they're they're doing zoo animals and uh, you know, yeah. So. Yeah. But okay, we'll going back up, there was another one here. It's please tell us about your uh, I don't I N D O T Y P H L O P S. Indo oh, Tiflops. Tiflops. Yeah, yeah. In Indo Tiflops. Uh, yes. Uh, of course, that's the Brahmini uh, blind snake. Oh, okay. They look like a worm. They're black, jet black, but they're a snake. And uh, they turned up in New Orleans in, a, in the uh, late 1980s, maybe early 1990s. And we knew they were coming. I mean, I'd been looking for them for a long time. And now they're not, they're not rare, but they're uncommon. 
And every now and again, somebody brings one in to show me or they send me a picture or I see it on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, they're very secretive and uh, they're burrowing animals and they don't have external eyes that, you know, like most snakes do. And uh, what's incredible about them is they're from Asia and they, uh, uh, like I said, they're burrowing. And so how did they get to the United States? They came in and potted plants. Because, you know, you're bringing in Asian plants and pots. Mm -hmm. And the reason they've been successful is because they have another characteristic that's amazing. They are parthenogenetic, which means an all-female species. No males. So when a, when a, a, a snake becomes an adult, Starts laying eggs, fertilized eggs. And uh, so, you know, one pot can bring one snake of a reproductive, or a male-female snake over here, and the other one dies before it finds a mate because there's no mates. But these girls, <laughs> when they arrive, they start laying eggs. And so they get moved around in pots and things like that. I'll be damned. And you may never see them, and they may be in your yard. But I found, like, I, I found one about five months ago on the Loyola campus. I was just walking to my office, and I walked by something on the sidewalk, and I went, whoa, and I went back, picked it up, and it was a dead one on our campus. Somebody Question. slept on it. Could you repeat the name of the snake? Yeah, it's called a Brahmini, B-R-A-H-M-I-N-Y. Blind snake. Thank you. Yeah. And the, the genus is endotiflops, right? Brahminus is a specific epithet. Thank you. But they're really just cool. It's just cool knowing they're here. I, I had a, when the first one that we found, I reported them near to the state. Uh, a, my phone rang one day at the Nature Center, and a guy says, says uh, I think I have a snake here that I I want to talk to you about. He said, it's black and skinny and shiny. And I went, oh my gosh, it's here. It's finally here. <laughs> and uh, so I ran over to his house. And in fact, that's what it was. And um, I said, how did you find this? He says, I keep lizards as pets. So I walk around the neighborhood and anywhere there's a vacant lot, I look to see if there's any boards or anything. And he said, I, and I, so I was looking under some boards on this lot right around the corner and I found it. And he said, it, and it, you know, there were a lot of termites there and stuff. So I figured that's probably what it's feeding on. And I said, well, first of all, how did you know it was a snake? He said, well, I was looking at it real close and it stuck a fart tongue out. <laughs> and I don't think any worms have fart tongues. <laughs> and I said, well, that's wonderful. And uh, uh, so anyway, I was very excited about that. And, and then they stay, they're turning up like they're, they turn up probably more often at the zoo because they import so many tropical plants. Fascinating. Really cool. Yeah, they're all over the United States now, even in Boston and places like that. Okay. Uh, just to share this with everybody, Liz reports that in Texas, they had a 13-year-old who was a wonderful herpetologist. She did their lecture on snakes, and they made her a junior member, and she paid no dues. And she's a big asset to the group. We might have to do this with Ma Amanda yeah. Serio's son because he's just yeah. like he wants in. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's, yeah, there's just liability issues. Yeah, I and know. Then, and then I once know. you do that for, for a kid who's wonderful right. and perfect. You get a brat. <laughs> then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just didn't want that to happen. I got it. And, uh, I get it. But. But there have been events that we've had where we welcome those excited kids. Well, we have occasionally, not very often, but just for general information, we do what we call family fun days up here in the northeast mm -hmm. corner Perfect. that are not certification workshops. We just yeah. you know bring your kids, bring your grand yeah. grandkids, uh, and that's when he's participating. He went on a hike with us, uh, with a handful of us at Camp Partner the other day, uh, and had a great time. And so family fun days, that's yeah. what we do. That's great. Encourage those kids. We figure we're going to get a future member anyway. <laughs> sure. No, great idea. 
anything else that anybody wants to ask, uh, I'm going to just tag on to our discussion of diversity to share something that I just found mm -hmm. out a few days ago. Uh, the ranger at Black Bayou Lake National Wildlife Refuge is an African-American woman. Her name is Nova Clark. She's a wonderful educator. She's on our board. Um, she's been a big supporter of us. Uh, and she's leaving. She's taking another job. Oh, see. And we're, I'm so, yeah, the Paxtons are going. Uh, I, I mean, she just told me this, and she didn't tell me it was a secret. I think it's public yeah. information now. But here's the, the, the even worse problem it's not clear that they're going to replace her in these days yeah. of national cutting of budgets for NWRs right and left. Right. We might lose our education person, which is really, really devastating. But anyway, uh, so, you know, I know we don't as an organization lobby, but I'm encouraging everybody to make your presence known with your legislators. Yeah. Well, I encourage everybody out there to really focus on that diversity issue. And I, I think, I mean, I, I think most chapters that I know of, They've got diversity covered when it comes to age and gender and all those other things. But, uh, but where we lack is uh, we don't have enough black members. And because we, in, in our chapter, we've had uh, quite a few Hispanics and a, and a good number of, of Asian people have gone through the program. But uh, uh, since it's happening, I've got to think that it's our fault that we could do better than that. So even though we think we work hard at it, we haven't quite figured out how to make it happen. I agree. Because we've had some valued members who are African-Americans and they were just wonderful to have in the crowd, so. I think that's all the questions, Janie. Okay, well, um, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us tonight and thank Bob for your time and Betty for helping sure. me make sure I got all the Zoom, Zoom connections right. And um, I know that at our um, uh, last state board meeting, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, what everybody was doing and with this new Zoom account. And uh, now that we've ventured into this um, statewide Zoom uh, meeting, we talked about how um, if other chapters are doing something uh, via Zoom, um, if, if they um, could accommodate other people because you know we're not really limited by numbers and so that's something that we are going to uh, work on so that if you have a, a program that um, you're sharing by zoom um, uh, perhaps we can have a, a, a better networking going on throughout the state so that um, other um, people could, could join in and benefit yeah I, I, I was gonna, if you have a, a suggested topic to do another statewide meeting like this let us uh, tell tell one exactly. of your representatives to the board. We'll do it. Yeah. Well, let, let me say this. We're and, and all of you volunteer if you're doing something like this. I mean, we're doing those weekly programs on Wednesday evenings. So uh, I'll talk to my gang that's that's heading that up. Janelle, uh, our president, uh, Janelle Simpson is is sort of heading that up, and I'll just ask her to open it up. Bob, have you already started those Wednesday meetings? Yeah, yeah, I think we've done three of them. Okay, we do ours on Wednesday, too. We have Ooh. Wednesday meetings as well. What time? We have it at, uh, at 6.30 on Wednesday. Okay, I think we're doing ours at 7. Uh, you know what? I'm going to have uh, uh, Janelle call you. Okay. Because All right, because I would like for us not to compete with each other. So that exactly. They both. Yeah. I agree. All right, have her give me a call. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you all for being there. And I, I'm you. sorry, sorry I, I was in a position to talk about myself too dead gum much. No, but uh, we wanted. Anyway, yeah. we wanted. Uh, this you. is recorded, and, um, and I will, um, um, through your board members, I will let you know how to get the link to uh, see the recording for some people who might not be able to join us. Great. Thanks, Great. Janie.